Coming up on Network Africa. Gambia's leader Adama Barrow self-isolates after the country's vice president contracts coronavirus. Kenya closes colleges and universities for the rest of the year in a bid to curb the spread of COVID-19. Plus, Cote d'Ivoire's president Alassane Ouattara wins his party's nomination for a third term. Thank you for joining us on the program. Welcome. I'm Layo Adegoke. We begin today in West Africa with news that the Gambia's president, Adama Barrow, has gone into self-isolation following his vice president's Issa Toure's test positive for COVID-19. Ms. Toure says she is in good spirits and will go into quarantine. Now, according to a statement from the presidency, President Barrow will isolate for two weeks. The country has so far confirmed 326 coronavirus cases and eight deaths and the government has been urging citizens to wear masks and maintain a distance of three steps between each one to prevent the spread of the virus. Well, to East Africa, Kenya's education minister says colleges and universities will remain closed until January 2021 after failing to comply with safety protocols to curb the spread of the virus. Minister George Magoha says universities will continue offering online classes, including examinations and even graduations. He adds that the ministry will continue inspecting colleges and universities to ensure that they are safe for reopening come 2021. Kenyan learning institutions were closed in March after the country confirmed its first coronavirus case. The government also cancelled the school year for primary and secondary schools. While Muslims across the world are preparing to mark the major festival of Eid al-Adha amid the COVID-19 pandemic, in Egypt, prayers in mosques have been banned, though in the latter opening hours of restaurants and cafes have been extended ahead of Eid following a decline in coronavirus cases in recent weeks. Over in Algeria, Muslims have been trying to keep the tradition of buying sheep ahead of the holiday with lockdown measures to curb the spread of the virus still largely in place as infections rise in the country. ...are trying to keep the tradition of buying sheep for religious sacrifice ahead of the annual Eid Adha despite the lockdown measures and restrictions on gatherings to curb the spread of the novel coronavirus. They say this Eid is different from previous ones as many are either sick or suffering financially from the wave of unemployment that swept through the nation in March. This Eid is a little different from the previous ones. People are suffering from this virus, so the joy won't be the same. It was part of the tradition. Families used to gather to celebrate together. But this year, everyone will be at home to avoid contact with others. We will just perform our rituals and may God accept it as Sunday. Fewer sheep markets are open in the capital, each advising strict precautionary measures to prevent infection. Masks are mandatory as well as routine disinfection before and after the inspection of sheep. A limit on the number of customers within the market is also set in place. We took the necessary measures because of the virus. The mask, disinfecting, and all the necessary procedures. Sales won't be like previous years. The quantity won't be the same. We also accept three people inside at once. In addition to families' inability to celebrate in groups, many are unable to buy livestock after having lost much of their income. Despite the rarity of livestock due to the restrictions on movement and imports across provinces, prices are nonetheless the same. A North African country has so far reported 27, 357 confirmed coronavirus cases, including 1,125 deaths, with several neighborhoods in the capital isolated for being epicenters for the spread of the virus. 
And very briefly, away from the COVID-19 pandemic, Egypt's President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi has ratified a law banning active or former officers from running for the presidency or parliament without the permission of the Supreme Military Council. They are also banned from joining political parties. Now, critics say this law is designed to entrench President Sisi's power by preventing on any other military figures from squaring off against him. In 2018, the former military chief of staff, Sami Annan, was arrested after the military accused him of seeking to run in the presidential election without permission. The army is highly visible in Egypt, with all but two presidents having military backgrounds since the country became a republic. The new law will also see military advisers assigned to each of Egypt's 27 governor rates. Well, we have VOA's correspondent, Edward Yerenian, joining us now for more on this. Ed, good to see you. Thank you for speaking to us on Network Africa. My pleasure, Lyle. Firstly, what's the mood like in Egypt and the rest of North Africa, you know, ahead of the Eid holidays and especially within this COVID-19 pandemic? Well, I think people were hurt economically by the uh, the virus and the measures that were taken by governments, not only Egypt, but also in other North African states. Uh, but here in Cairo, you can sense that people are enthusiastic and the usual fervor that we know Egyptians to have for the, the holiday is, is still there. I still see a lot of enthusiasm in people uh, people's eyes and uh, people have been going about their business and uh, many go home. And uh, I, I would say that, that people are in a good mood, to, so to speak. Uh, in other countries, well, I mean, in neighboring Libya, of course, people are are um, worried about the political situation, about a conflict erupting uh, between the two governments, those countries that back them. Um, in Sudan, of course, they've had a political transition, but the number of coronaviruses in, in Sudan is down to, to zero, according to the figures I've seen for the last 24 hours. Um, and Sudanese people that I speak with here in Cairo seem to be very enthusiastic uh, about getting back to their lives. Uh, of course, there are other things going on, but uh, in, in Saudi Arabia, they're going ahead with the uh, the Hajj, even though they're not bringing in the usual two million people from outside the country. Uh, the people that were interviewed on TV seem to be enthusiastic about it. Of course, you can't tell, unless you're on the ground, how people, the mood of people in Saudi Arabia, but that being said, there seemed to be a general good feeling coming out of the people that were being interviewed for the Hajj. All right, and that's really good. And as citizens prepare in Cairo, where you are, what has been the level of compliance to social distancing measures? Uh, you know, I think Egyptians are not totally compliant. I, I think many people don't like the measures, and uh, you can see that some are rejecting them and, and not uh, not complying, and other people are. I, I, I couldn't give you a, an exact figure, but uh, my impression is that uh, a lot of people are not complying. All right, and just before I let you go, Ed, in Egypt, President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi has ratified this new law banning active or former officers from running from the presidency, you know, without the permission of the Supreme Military Council. What exactly does this mean for the country? Help us understand this. Uh, well, we've had several very high-profile military candidates in recent elections other than President Sisi, um, the, the latest being Sami Anand, the former uh, chief of staff, army chief of staff, as you mentioned in your report. Um, he was asked to withdraw, and uh, the media claimed that he was arrested. I mean, arrested, the army said that he was uh, drafted back into service. I, I mean, you could put it both ways, but uh, I guess uh, they don't want any other military candidates uh, that will uh, challenge the president, the current president. And. Uh, you know, I, I think there are other countries uh, in this part of the world that do similar things. I don't know that that's unusual. But, of course, um, 
many democracy groups are upset about it, uh, more so outside of the country than inside the country, from what I can see, though. All right. Thank you, Edward Yeranian, Yeranian, VOA's correspondent in Cairo. Thank you for speaking to us. My pleasure. To matters on politics, Cote d'Ivoire's ruling RHDP party has officially nominated President Alassane Ouattara to seek re-election for a third term. Mr. Ouattara on Wednesday asked for more time to consider this nomination, indicating he would announce his decision in a speech to the nation on August the 6th. Earlier this year, the 78-year-old Ouattara spoke of paving way for a new generation to lead. His prime minister and preferred successor, Amadou Gon, Koulibaly unfortunately died of cardiac arrest earlier this month. The opposition has been against the possibility of the president serving a third term and the country is due to hold elections on October 31st and the Electoral Commission is promising a fair election. Cote d'Ivoire's Electoral Commission promises a fair election as the ruling RHDP party asks President Ouattara to stand again, defying opponents who say he does not have the constitutional right to a third term. The election is seen as the biggest test yet to attain the stability achieved since a brief civil war killed about 3,000 people in 2010 and 2011. The election commission's role is particularly sensitive. A dispute over Watara's 2010 poll victory sparked the conflict and opposition parties suspect local election officers favor Watara. The presidential race was upset earlier this month by the death of the preferred successor of Ouattara, Prime Minister Amadou Gon Kolobali, after the 78-year-old economist had said he could not stand again. Dear supporters, you know how painful these moments are for me in particular and for Aja Fatoumata Gon Kolobali, wife of late Prime Minister Kolobali. You see, we often say in Africa that it is the son who organizes his father's or his mother's funeral and not the other way around. So you understand, because Amadou was my son. Responding to a formal request from his party on Wednesday to run for re-election, Watara asked for some time to consider, but added, you know I have not disappointed you. Addressing party members, he said he would announce his decision in a speech to the nation. He was due to make a public address on August 6th. Opponents say the two-term limit in the constitution bars him from standing again, but Watara has said his first two terms mandates do not count under the charter from 2016. The other main confirmed candidate is Henry Conan Bedier, who was president from 1993 to 1999 and leads one of the Côte d'Ivoire's largest parties, the PDCI. Bédier says he had agreed with the former president Zagbabo that their parties would back the other's candidate in the event of a second round runoff against Ouattara. Bagbo, who resides in Belgium and was acquitted of war crimes by the International Criminal Court last year, has not yet confirmed he will run as candidate of his FPI party. But his application for travel documents to return to Côte d'Ivoire has raised expectations that an announcement could be imminent. All members of parliament whose elections have been contested in Mali say they won't resign as recommended by five heads of state from the regional bloc ECOWAS who are trying to resolve the political crisis in the country. The MPs say the suggestion made by ECOWAS violates the constitution. The opposition has been calling for President Ibrahim Boubacar Keita to resign over corruption allegation and some 31 legislators from his party whose elections were also contested. To resolve the crisis, ECOWAS proposed that the government and opposition form a unity government and that the MPs resign. President Cater formed the crisis cabinet in anticipation of forming a unity government, but there was no word on the resignation of the MPs. Meanwhile, the Muslim cleric seen as the driving force behind Mali's protest movement says the country's political crisis could be resolved without President Ibrahim Boubacar Keita resigning. At least 14 protesters were killed earlier this month in demonstrations that they have shaken the government 
since June and raised fears that instability could derail the fight against Islamist extremists in West Africa's Sahel region. Despite concessions from Qatar and recommendations for moderate reforms by regional leaders, the M5 RFP coalition organizing the protest said on Tuesday it wanted Qatar gone and has called for more civil disobedience. Still ahead on the program. A giant of African music, Senegalese singer Bala Sidibe, a founding member of orchestra Baobab, dies. Thank you for joining us. New research indicates a third of all children have high levels of lead in their blood, putting their mental and physical health at risk. The study says Africa is the worst affected region after South Asia, with Nigeria topping the list for the region. The research is carried out by the UN's Children Agency and the environmental group Pure Earth, warning of concentrations of lead in the body can be so high that they stop the development of the brain, heart and other vital organs. Lead comes mainly from inadequately recycled waste like batteries and industries such as mining and open air smelters. The report's authors have called for urgent action to stop children being poisoned on what they say is a massive and previously unrecognized scale. To security matters now, an international pressure group says dozens of people have been kidnapped for ransom by criminal gangs in the east of the Democratic Republic of Congo. Human Rights Watch says more than half of those taken between 2017 and 2020 were women. It adds that most were raped, sometimes many times a day. People are taken from their fields into Virunga National Parks. Some families have sold their land in order to pay those ransoms. A Rwandan rebel group, Rod Runana, operates in the region, but it is not clear whether it is responsible for the kidnappings. There's also a new report on human trafficking that says armed groups in South Sudan are forcefully recruiting women and girls for sexual exploitation. The report by the International Organization for Migration also says that children are being recruited into combat and non-combat roles. Jean-Philippe Chauzi, the IOM chief in South Sudan, says forced marriage, domestic servitude and sexual exploitation, particularly among women and children, as well as labor exploitation, are amongst the most prevalent forms of trafficking in the country. Meanwhile, the United Nations Refugee Agency says nearly half of all violence against migrants during their journey from Africa to the Mediterranean Sea are perpetrated by law enforcement authorities. According to a report released by UNHCR and the Mixed Migration Center, MMC, thousands of refugees and migrants are facing extreme human rights abuses, including torture, sexual and gender-based violence, and in some cases, death, during their journeys to reach Africa Mediterranean coast. UNHCR reported that 1,750 people died in 2018 and 2019 trying to reach the sea, but officials believe the figures are likely to be higher. 47% of the case, the victims reported the perpetrators of violence are law enforcement authorities. Whereas in the past, we, we believe that it was mainly smugglers and traffickers, yet, they, yes, they are key perpetrators of violence, but the primary perpetrators of violence are people who are supposed to protect. Uh, so when we say nothing can be done, well, no, something can be done. States have responsibility that they need to discharge in that, respe in that respect. Uh, from the report, we can consider that an estimate of 72 persons minimum died overland, even before reaching uh, uh, Libya or Morocco or Egypt, uh, their, their place of uh, initial destination in their journey. Um, that's a low estimate in our view, in the sense that the number of deaths on land is more or less the same than the number of deaths at sea for 2018-2019. Uh, 
but that's just a visible tip of the iceberg. There are many families looking for their beloved ones along the routes, and there is no answer to give them. So we believe actually the number of people dying over land is much more higher than the number of people dying at sea. While for many girls and young women forced to stay at home as schools remain shut, menstruation comes at a high cost. They often have to choose between food on the table and basic hygiene. But a new initiative by Plan International has eased the burden on families by offering free showers and sanitary towels. For girls like 15-year-old Jacinta Mutathia, menstruation comes at a high cost. She lives in Mathare, one of the most densely populated informal settlements in Kenya's capital, Nairobi, where water is in short supply. Most girls' hygiene needs used to be met by their schools, providing free sanitary pads as well as bathrooms and showers. But with schools closed amid lockdown measures, Jacinta says families face a choice between hygiene and putting food on the table. Before, girls were not showering, and if you ask why, they would say that they cannot shower in the house because their fathers are there. Also, there's no money, and their mothers have no money to pay for a shower because they have to consolidate funds for meals. That's why charity Plan International has launched the Shower for Girls initiative, offering free showers and sanitary pads to girls like Jacinta and her friend Glorian Rarimu. They have saved my mother some money because it's the money she would have used to pay for my shower to get us at least three cans of water. Plan International Country Director Kate Mena Vorley says she wanted to respond to the specific needs of girls in a way that was very personal and transformative. We wanted to ensure that we were responding to specific needs for girls in a way that is very personal and that is transformative. So we'll be looking to see what are the lessons learned from that and how we might scale that up and how that informs our urban programming as we move forward. The charity is also calling on the Kenyan government to prioritize hygiene for girls as a part of its ongoing response to the pandemic. And finally, on the program, Senegalese singer Bala Sidibe, who's a founding member of Orchestra Baobab, has died in Dakar. The country's musical association said Sidibe died in his sleep after a very full day of rehearsals with his musical comrades. He was said by local media to have had a short illness, but no further details were given, and he died in his 60s. Orchestra's Baobab's blend of Cuban rhythms, African sound, soul, and jazz made it one of the most successful groups of the 1970s. The group's former record label paid tribute to a giant of African music and a great and gentle man. Or condolences to the family. And that's where we end Network Africa today. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Layo Adeguti.